Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us for the Appalachian Energy Summit webinar series. My name is Lee Ball and I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer at Appalachian State University. The Appalachian Energy Summit is a convening of energy, sustainability, transportation, and waste professionals across higher education, local government, and industry with a goal to exchange knowledge and best practices. The Appalachian Energy Summit webinar series is our attempt to continue some of these efforts as a result of the COVID pandemic. The title of today's webinar is Principles of Integrated Project Delivery. This is the last webinar in the series. We're currently planning a spring webinar, so please stay tuned for more information on that. Today we have presenting Howard W. Ashcraft Jr., who is a partner with Hanson Bridget LLP. Howard Ashcraft has led the development and use of integrated project delivery and in building information modeling in the United States, Canada, and abroad. Over the past decade, his team has structured over 160 pure ID, IPD projects and worked on many highly integrated projects. Welcome, Howard. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm certainly uh, honored to be involved with the Energy Summit and it's a really very important work that you're all doing. I'd like to talk a little bit about integrated project delivery and we'll talk uh, somewhat about how we've used it on um, some highly sustainable projects. I would like to share my screen for a moment. So um, we will go to Integrated Project Delivery. So uh, Lee, if you can confirm that my screen is coming through, are we all good? Yep, we're all good. Okay, so um, IPD, one of the things about IPD is it has too many TLAs, which are three letter acronyms, but uh, we'll work with it. IPD essentially is a process that, uh, let me move just something so I can see, move that bar. Okay, this is really a definition of IPD and the probably seminal document in the United States for collaborative project delivery is done by the AIA California Council and it was integrated project delivery originally in a working definition in 2007 and then updated in 2014. It really says that there are five following elements. And notice that I said at a minimum, because there's some other things you very often see in IPD projects. But this basic concept of early, early contractor, early designer involvement in a team that the business interests are aligned through shared risk and reward and um, the financial gains at risk and it's dependent upon project outcomes, which can include and often do, do, does include KPIs of some sort, which can be uh, sustainability issues or energy issues. Uh, those are, are cranked into projects some of the time. Joint project control. Uh, this is not hierarchical, it's flat. I just finished um, the first part of a long uh, contra IPD contract negotiation for a, about a $3.8 billion project. And the, uh, I was literally, I just got off that call. And we're putting together the group that's actually going to basically uh, develop the joint project control. And then we have a multi-party agreement, single agreement signed by many, many parties. Uh, much simpler way of doing this, although you can do interlocking agreements and limited liability among owner and key designers. The reason why I threw this out is that very often when we talk about integrated project delivery, people focus on one or two aspects of it. And they'll say, well, I do IPD. I've always done IPD. That's the way we do business. Yet that usually indicates that they really haven't thought through all of the implications of what this is. It's a little bit of a complex definition, but it covers the things. I like a simpler definition. Um, integrated project delivery, we're trying to create a virtual organization aligned to the project. And we do that uh, both contractually and collaboratively. 
and there's several different aspects to it. So as we go through this, I'd like you to keep a couple thoughts in mind. Really is what problem are you trying to solve? Because when we actually look at project delivery, I don't take the position that there is one perfect project delivery system, or even that you never have to modify a project delivery system. I try to focus on what problem am I trying to solve? And um, that may also may be what opportunity am I trying to get the benefit of? And you build the system to match. A lot of people think you can take a project delivery system or a contract just off the shelf and just plug it in. Uh, that doesn't optimize outcomes. It might get you there sometimes. It may be easy, but it doesn't optimize opt uh, outcomes. You want to be focusing on what problem are you trying to solve, choosing a project delivery system, and um, optimizing it for that problem or opportunity. Talk a little bit about how IP, how does IPD compare to other project delivery systems? Once again, we often have situations where people say, well, I can do that this other way. Well, maybe yes and maybe no. Um, the research from uh, Minnesota, basically, in the University of Minnesota basically indicates, and in our experience is probably not. Um, is IPD a sustainability enabler? Um, I believe it very strongly is, and I'll explain how, and we've used it on high sustainability projects. Let me back up a little bit, and just in our background, we started doing IPD projects in the mid-2000s. I was involved with AIACC uh, in developing the original standards. We've been, our, our team's done about 170 of these projects or so. Uh, and all across uh, North America and internationally. Uh, and a lot of those have actually had uh, high sustainability goals. And you'll see why that actually fits in. Uh, I also teach uh, at Stanford and at Oxford, uh, really basically around this, this subject area. How'd I get here? My personal experience as a construction litigator since 1979 was that we weren't learning. Uh, I was going through Groundhog Day all the time. I was constantly solving the same problem that I'd solved the year before. And that struck me as being kind of stupid. Um, and I got involved with, um, before it was called Building Information Modeling, the Object Oriented Design. and uh, looked at the promise that had deep early collaboration, immersive digital interaction, using common data stores and libraries, interoperability. And it all sounded great. But even with BIM, failure was rampant and success was random. If you actually look at some of the statistics, and I will actually pull a few things up later, it's really bad. So I'd like you to stop for a moment and uh, change hats. You're now an investor and, and I've got a deal for you. I'm in the shark tank making my pitch because I've got a uh, company that I think can make about 500 million over the next couple of years. Uh, it's got a really good design director, Jeff. He's really, really phenomenal. And our operations, uh, Andrea, she's first class. In fact, everybody's first class. Um, they all, uh, by the way, are on a bonus system. The bonus systems are all different. Um, the, we we don't actually don't have a president. We don't have a CFO. We don't have a CEO. We don't have a board of directors. Don't have an executive committee. Actually, we've never worked together before. And there's nobody who actually is responsible to seeing whether or not the company is successful. How many of you want to invest in my business? Since my phone is not ringing off the hook, I kind of think I'm not getting a lot of money from you folks. If you actually stop and think, I've just described traditional project delivery. And it's something that if you change the way you think about it, no one would really want to do. 
So it turns out that as we were trying to look at how to optimize project delivery and start coming up with IPD, we also started doing some research and found that in fact, uh, there were a whole series of white papers, studies uh, that went over a period of about 23 years, actually you can go about 40 years, that talked about what it took to actually get highly functioning design and construction, how to actually get to high performance. Um, and they basically said the same thing, that design and construction was adverse, that it was inefficient, that it did not use technology well and was built on the wrong business models. The one I like the most is World Economic Forum because they had a breakthrough um, when they actually decided that they agreed with uh, work that had been done 20, 30 years ago. So um, if you looked at some of the earliest reports, I could publish these, these statements today and they would just be as applicable to design and construction as they were in 1994. Um, if we look at the Kurt White papers and look at their recommendation of what to do in 2006, it's pretty much a definition of integrated project delivery. If we look at McKinsey in 2017, talks about the same thing. In fact, we're having to rewire the contractual framework to shape industry dynamics. So we've known for over 20 years what the problem is and how to fix it. So you would essentially assume that the problem has been totally solved. If you actually look at the data, it's actually the opposite way. Uh, the data still shows, this is an um, economist from 2017, that efficiency is a problem. Uh, if you look at labor productivity, Paul, Paul Teicholz, who's a professor emeritus in the program I teach in at Stanford, uh, has done labor productivity and construction. Um, everything but construction is that nice line going up and construction is the line going down. Um, if you look internationally, you come up with the same same answers. If you look more recently by, by different types of, of uh, organizations, the same answers. Um, you look at, that's a little bit of an older study, but a CII, Construction Industry Institute study, 70% of projects don't meet their schedule and cost goals. By the way, if you don't meet your schedule and cost goals, you're not meeting your sustainability goals either. Because that's the first thing people tend to cut. Um, and ask you, this is another little thought experiment, go on to a, uh, the car lot to buy your new car and talk to the car dealer and comes out and says, hey, we've got lots of cars. We've got lots of cars. Let me make a deal. Let's make a deal. By the way, 70% of our cars don't work. 70% of our cars are not any good. I suspect you would go to a new dealership. Bigger projects gets even worse. Uh, this is mega projects, this McKinsey data. 98% uh, of mega projects um, based on cost and overrun. So when we were developing integrated project delivery and we realized that people knew what the problem was and they had a pretty good idea what the solution ought to be, the real interesting question to me is why haven't we done it? And this, by the way, will tie directly into sustainability. And the decision we came to is that in fact, we can't tweak our way out of this problem. There's a lot of people who think, well, if we just had better technology, if we could buy our way out of this problem, we would have already have done it. We can't just buy, we can't use the same solve the same problems. So what it turns out is as we started looking at the issues, project structure was a major, major impediment to actually producing better buildings. Let's look at uh, a simple structure, OPEX and CAPEX. Uh, most large organizations have an OPEX budget, operational expenditures, and a CAPEX, uh, capital expenditures. And they're completely different budgets. Partially that's driven by tax reasons. 
there's some other reasons. But um, you all know, since this is the energy summit, that the operating expenditures for a building are substantially greater. In fact, if you look at a, we'll come back, but this is out of a text that I co-wrote called Integrating Project Delivery, uh, available through Wiley. And if you look at the economic value of, a pro of an average project, and this is just conceptual, design and construction costs are much lower than the operational costs and have, are, do not necessarily relate to the income or value of the facility. So we spend all this time trying to optimize design and construction costs, reduce CapEx, yet OpEx is really the big driver of our finances. And if you create these two, this structure with the two budgetary systems, it is very difficult for the CapEx people to walk over to the OpEx people and say, could you give me 20% of your budget for this year because I can use it to make a better building and I'll reduce your OpEx down the stream. Be a logical thing to do, but it doesn't happen because of the structure. Once you have an OpEx, CapEx structure, it's very hard to optimize project value. The other little problem with structure, uh, and this comes from a um, saying the French have, which is a fish is the last to discover water. And the reason is structure is all around us. Um, I'll give you another example. If you um, did not have the mortgage deduction in the United States tax code, and you did not have support for uh, petrochemicals, um, and did you in, and, and also to some degree roads, would you have suburbs? Um, in fact, there's a good argument that in fact, if you had, if in fact you had public transit and you did not have a mortgage deduction, you'd have apartments uh, in cities much as you would do in Europe. So there's other things going involved in that, but if you stop and think, that structure creates an outcome. The other thing is that project structures continually pull the project. So if in fact you can put a lot of energy into a system and you can overcome those project structures, but the moment your energy lags, they tend to pull right back where they were going. Wouldn't it make a lot more sense to actually use structures that took you where you wanted to go? Let's look at a couple structures that exist in traditionally in design and construction. First is the volume incentive. Traditionally, essentially, that, and I'll use designers for an example, um, every hour that they charge people it has an hour of profit, has a certain amount of profit in it. If they wanna make more profit, they have to sell more hours. Contractors, if they wanna make more money, have to sell you more of things because so many things they do are percentages of cost. That tends to, that, there's a couple implications for that. One of which is, why invest in research technology improvements if in fact there's no payback because that'll just make me more efficient so I have less hours or things to sell. Um, one of the reasons why the industry has one of the lowest investment uh, percentages of any major industry. What happens if you change the uh, business model though? Let's say we agree with everyone how much their stipulated profit, their basic profit should be and we pay their costs, whatever those happen to be. And cost has no profit. Well, now the incentive is to become more efficient. It also means it's worthwhile to actually invest in becoming better. It's worthwhile to put, uh, put new systems in place because they increase your profit margin and don't decrease your profit. If you went back and read those reports that I referenced, a lot of them talk about fragmentation. And right now we have a system which, in which we have individual optimization on most projects. 
So it's very possible for a trade contractor or a consultant to do very well on a project in a failed project, in a project that will fail. If you stop and think about, for instance, just how contingency is used. If a contractor is on a lump sum agreement, um, it's gonna have contingency. It's going to have similar uh, contracts it passes through to its trades, each of which will have a contingency. It turns out that's more contingency money, that's mo more contingency money in the project budget than it really needs. It also means that if something goes wrong, let's say at a trade level, since their contingency is based on a probability of an occurrence that has now occurred, they actually don't have enough money. How, how likely do you think it is that the mechanical contractor can go over to the civil contractor and say, hey, civil, you've done really, really well. Could I have some of your contingency because I'm not doing so well on this project? So what we end up doing is creating bubbles of contingency that are locked up that are too much in total and not enough for the individual, uh, individual issue. Uh, you will also create a situation where a number of other uh, issues with regard to lack of collaboration are caused by that. Change the system, change the behavior. Uh, if you go to a, a situation where all the parties are under the key parties are under contract with each other and they have shared risk reward on their profit. Well, now you have a situation where in fact, you can have a single pool of contingency, uh, which is shared and used however it, it means. That means there's more money, which means you can do more in the project. It also means that there's no uh, incentive to blame anyone inside that circle because doing so only increases the cost which reduces your own profit. Uh, same happens to do with the way we, we tr traditionally deal with contracts of essentially allowing people to avoid and transfer when something goes wrong. Uh, if you look at a standard construction contract, what it says is something if you contractor discovers an error in the plans, first thing it must do is put someone on notice and start the claims process. If you had a high performance team, wouldn't you want them to just solve the problem? So why don't you close most of those, loop, most of those loopholes, tie people's contract together and say they jointly have an obligation to solve it. You don't completely get rid of change orders, but you drastically reduce them. So let's talk about IPD really now as a system. And we've talked a little bit about the importance of structure and we're gonna talk about what those structures are, but there are other things. It's a cocktail. You've gotta have the glass right, that's the structure. You need to have the environment right, um, which if, if you want is the ingredients, is some of the ingredients going in. You need an operating system, which is usually lean construction design and construction, and you need, excuse me, to use appropriate technology, which in my case is the olive. The point being that if you only have one, you don't have a cocktail. And a lot of people only have one, and in IPD, we wanna do it all. Um, Co-wrote a book with Martin, Professor Martin Fisher at Stanford, Dean Reed, and uh, Dr. Atul Pizzotti out of uh, DPR. And we started looking at how to achieve a high performance project. And we were specifically thinking, in fact, we were in one of the first lead platinum uh, 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 academic buildings at the time we were writing this, uh, which is a net, net zero building. And we said, instead of just coming up with some good ideas, why don't we stop thinking about what we're trying to do? And we create the concept of a high performance project, which was buildable, usable, operable, and sustainable. And then we asked the question, okay, how do you get there? And we came up with a simple framework. If you have a high performance building, you need fully integrated systems and they need to work together. Uh, if you want to actually get a reduced energy usage, you obviously have to focus on building massing, uh, insulation, 
uh, fenestration. You have to focus on um, the lighting, the kind of the color of the paint you use inside uh, to paint the walls, how you handle local lighting, uh, the mechanical systems, the electrical, uh, electrical systems. The basic point is they all have to work together and be designed to work together. So we said, okay, if that's true, what do you need to do that? Well, it turns out that the people who really know about how to make that happen are not necessarily the initial designers. It's in fact, usually the uh, facilities people, the trade contractors, the uh, manufacturers. We needed to get to take this pro what we call process knowledge and pull it back to the point where it can be used by the designers. And we needed to have to integrate all that information, which got us to the next thing of how you actually do that means you have to have the people available. It can't be done in design, build, build because the people aren't available. Um, we actually have to pull that back in and create an integrated organization, which is my virtual organization, my drone on the project. And then we have to have a way for them to actually take, uh, make that information available to everyone and use it. And by integrated, I'm talking about not just building information modeling, which we heavily use, but also talking about essentially having all the information necessary to understand how the project in the building is performing available to the design team. Think about the dashboard of a car. If you've got anything of a modern car, it's got an ECU in it, an okay, engine control unit, a computer that is, that is monitoring all kinds of data. You, by the way, would probably have no idea, most of you at least, how to do anything with that data. So the manufacturer takes all that data, it uses some of it to self-manage the project um, car and some to provide information to you on a dashboard of information you can use to make decisions. Am I out of fuel? How fast am I going? Is the engine overheating? Um, well, you know, where do I have to go? How do I get there? All that information is provided to you so you can manage that process. We need to do the same thing on a project basis. And we use a number of, of systems to do that. We use performance metrics. Uh, that can be uh, sustainability metrics. We use production management lean. We use um, basically high intensity engineering, integrated concurrent engineering. Uh, comes out of the Jet Propulsion Lab um, at Pasadena with Mars Rover people. And we use simulation visual visualization. So we, uh, for instance, some of the early projects are simulating basically different options in terms of energy use uh, within type side buildings. And we tie it together with an integration agreement. And this essentially is the basic construct of how we use a integrated system to get to a high performance building. Now, graphics have a tendency to imply things. And this implies that this is a sequential process. In fact, the process is more like this. It actually happens simultaneously. We still have a high performance building. We still have all the basic uh, uh, portions, integrated organization, integrated systems, integrated information, uh, integrated process, collaboration, co-location, all these things are happening and they're bound by the integration agreement. They're more or less happening simultaneously. Let's look at practice. Here's the pieces we normally have in an IPD project. Profit separated from cost. I explained the reason for that. Cost guaranteed. By the way, Sutter Health has done a whole bunch of these, has found that their cost reliability is greater in IPD without a GMP than they were ever getting out of CM at risk with a GMP. Profit based on project outcome, limited change orders. Um, Contract structure, early involvement in key parties, um, anyone who, can, who really provides benefit by being there early, and that's a lot of the team. By the way, the most recent research indicates that you really want to have uh, pretty much your whole team in place at about by 10% of design. Uh, joint decision making, shared risk reward, jointly developed targets, and targets include sustainability. Uh, reduce liability amongst the parties. We don't 
want them to be able to point fingers at each other. We want them to solve problems. Uh, we optimize the whole, not the parts. Uh, we focus on trust. Trust is built on competence, uh, integrity, and reliability. But we build trust during the project. Uh, Short-term projects, by the way, you kind of have to start with parties who can trust each other because you don't have time to build the trust. But in larger projects, you can build it. Integration of people, process, and systems. We focus on continuous learning through the project, and we use appropriate technology and truly deeply collaborate. Now, uh, let me back up for a second. If you look at those pieces, and this is out of the working definition 2014, and look at the World Economic Forum, uh, what they decided projects needed, the only spot that's different is there. They build in third party mediation and conciliation. Uh, we don't because we want the team to be basically not have an easy opportunity to go to someone else with a complaint. We want them to solve the problem. But other than that, our uh, World Economic Forum's analysis comes out exactly the way we've been doing these projects. Um, and then McKinsey basically has come to the same conclusion. Uh, We use two structures. A uh, three-party IPD basically has owner, um, architect, or lead designer, if it's an engineer, and a contractor, and they're under a uh, they're under a single contract shown by the dark arrows. The other parties uh, may be in the risk reward group, but they're under subcontracts or subconsulting agreements. And then there's always some folks outside the circle, just because it's uh, not worth their scope is too small uh, to make it worthwhile bringing them in. Hold on a second, let me kill that. Uh, this is the poly party. This is what I was actually negotiating this morning uh, with more like 11 parties. Um, but basically, now we have a single contract which binds the 11 parties or seven or 11 or whatever the number, number happens to be. Uh, and they're all in the risk reward group and they're all in contract with each other. Certain parties have more responsibilities, which is why the owner and the architect contractor have larger uh, ovals here. And, but the basic business and liability deal is the same for everybody inside the circle. Uh, this is some early research which backs up my point about when you want to have teams in, in place. 76% of the best projects in this study um, actually had their teams in place during conceptualization, 0 to 15% of design. That's probably at least one phase earlier than most people would have thought who were proponents of early contractor involvement. This is how we structure projects. Um, the left happens to be a very major health, health center. The right happens to be a, um, happens to be a uh, research campus. Notice the green team. Uh, the green team was basically providing sustainability uh, uh, oversight on how we did virtually everything in the project, both from red listing things going into the building to uh, the initial design, setting up the energy. Uh, we were spending a lot of time on energy and VOCs, um, coordinating that information. A phase that's really important in an IPD project is validation. If you look at up in the upper right hand corner, is another publication I was involved in. This one's free, by the way. Uh, which is called the Integrated Project Delivery and Action Guide for Leaders. Unlike the text, which goes into more, much more deeply into most of the subjects, this is more sort of like a how-to guide. But we talk about the point about value alignment through the validation plan so that we can come up with a report that really talks about what we're going to try to accomplish and how we're going to get it Done. It is not an estimate of a design. We're really trying to decide 
is the, do we have sufficient funds in order to achieve our objectives, even if we haven't figured out how to do it yet? Oh, but teams that do a good job doing this end up with a universal understanding of why we're doing the project and how to make it successful. Um, this happens just to be another, um, uh, prepared for another large project. Actually, it was prepared for the project I was talking about today. I'm explaining to some executives of how we actually go through the process of going from a business case, what we're trying to achieve, um, going through innovation, and how we end up with finally in the contract. Um, a little bit about financial scenarios. This is the simplest possible scenario. It's what I could call an alliance system. You set a target cost and um, you effectively put an amount of stipulated profit at risk. If the cost rises, the profit goes down. If the cost goes down, you get your profit plus some portion of savings. Um, and if, in theory, if the cost goes high enough, it eats up all the profit and could go into owner contingency. Of the 170 projects we've done, uh, we've got like one that's in the column five, the owner contingency, and we've maybe got another one or maybe two. Uh, we'll see on that one, one, one and a half in four. All the rest um, are in pretty much in one and um, one and three. A little bit into the basic point is that they traditionally uh, traditionally do better than originally planned um, on on par. Um, I say changes are limited. Basic system is we have buckets. If you're in the bucket, you can get a change order. If you're not in the bucket, you can't. One of the classic buckets that you, is not there is if there are uh, deficiencies in the design, if there are problems of errors, errors and omissions. That is not a bucket. That is a team managed risk. So uh, what that means is when you do that is the trades become very interested in understanding design intent and understanding what the designers are thinking about because they know they'll have to deliver it even if it was omitted. Here's how we do governance. Uh, this is on a smaller project. We just have a core group. Uh, which is usually made up at least of the owner, the contractor, and the designer may have a few other folks in it. And they are managers. They manage the project. The project implementation team is cross-functional, um, is our cross-functional teams that actually, um, where the work is actually done. And they're made of as I said, facility managers, manufacturers, contractors, um, uh, engineers, anybody who are actually other consultants, and they're based on functional areas or functional concepts. So MEPF might be, for instance, a classic um, pit group. This is slightly more complicated, and it's a two-level governance, and is used for larger projects where you have the project executives sitting up there in the SMT. If the project goes well, they're not going to be doing a whole lot. So the PMT still is running the project. And we choose the PMT members from people with inside the, inside the project on a best for project basis. In other words, we're not choosing the best architect to be on the PMT. We're choosing the best man, manager from the architect to be on the PMT. It's a management position, not so much a design position. This just talks a little bit about how we actually take a team from an initial business case all the way through to getting the agreement. Uh, we go through a, usually working with the owner and asking the, the basic question of why are you doing this? For example, there was a project that's currently on hold, but a uh, major biopharmaceutical company was going to uh, change the way they handled all of their um, energy for certain campuses solely for uh, sustainability reasons. There was no business case of making any money or reducing cost or anything else. 
they just felt their current system was not very green. And so they planned to make major improvements. So at that point, we were focusing on essentially providing the greenest source of energy we could and cooling particularly. Um, the team has to understand the why. Uh, in a traditional project, the team would then take a set of plans and specifications with only a vague understanding of why the owner wanted to do this and execute. In this system, we actually have to focus on why are we doing the project, creating um, what are our opportunities and constraints, and then building a business model to match. From that, we select the team. Then we work with the team in a contract workshop to reinforce those values. And then we eventually move in to creating an agreement. Um, there are a bunch of contract forms out there. Uh, by the way, if anybody wants the slides, I'll be happy to turn them into a PDF and shoot them, shoot them to you or shoot them to someone who can deliver them. Um, the probably most commonly used proprietary document is one we develop. It's our current versions. We have a poly-party and a, and a multi-party. But there are agreements prepared by others. Uh, the AIAC 191 is a bit old. Uh, it hasn't been updated for quite a while. And we've learned a few things. Um, and the most recent is, is the Canadian Contract Docs Committee, CDC 30, uh, which has been used for some sustainable projects. Um, if you're deciding whether or not IPD is important uh, for your project, here's some characteristics to take a look at. Um, if you're going for high sustainability goals, you really need integration. And IPD is currently the best way to achieve that. So uh, technical innovation, creative innovation, high sustainability, all those things drive you there. If you're also going to have change, it's pretty important to have a flexible system. In some industries, change is pretty, comp uh, pretty uh, common. In healthcare, it's extremely common. So we need to have a system that can react to change. IPD does very well for all that. If the interactions are complex and because of interdependency of systems, again, that's an integration issue and IPD is really good. If you're building a parking garage, eh, not so much. Design build might be just fine. And this is one of the big problems is that everybody says, yes, I can do that. Um, but then they don't want to do anything differently. Um, so you need to think about if you're going to go into IPD, whether or not you're really right for it. You know, are you really collaborative? A lot of people, you know, some people aren't. They just aren't. Um, are you a continuous learner? That's really what we're talking about here. Can you embrace change? Uh, if you're command and control, I know how to do this. Just get out of my way. That's not right for IPD. We're trying to create a system where the team is smarter than anybody in the room. If you get one person sort of basically dominating, the team is never is no, no smarter than that one person. Put in a couple charts taken out of the updated working definition, which looks at incentives and essentially look at who benefits under certain type project delivery systems. And you will see that uh, if you go from design, bid, build, to IPD, everything in risk, there are, they, the incentives differ and the incentives drive behavior. And you want to have a system that incentivizes all the parties as much as possible. IPD actually um, is successful here. By the way, you notice who is incentivized to improve construction process? Uh, design build does very well there. Um, because they keep the money if they are successful. So what are the results? We've done um, all these kinds of projects, a um, few others that haven't made the list yet. Uh, so it's applicable to a broad range of types of projects. Uh, this happens to be some healthcare data as, uh, from uh, Sutter Health mostly because they have delivered a lot of projects 
uh, their projects are almost always they're not their their projects are almost always focus on some level of energy savings. Um, you'll notice that their projects uh, basically are delivered quite reliably, which is what they're attempting to accomplish. Um, UC, uh, UCSF Med Center, uh, which uh, predated these, um, I think one was uh, it won a whole series of awards for energy utilization for a hospital. Uh, this is another project which was done as an in interesting demonstration project. Uh, RMI, that most of you know, Rocky Mountain Institute, wanted to create an innovation center and they decided to use IPD in order to do it. Um, the, it's, in one of, it's in a very harsh environment, both in terms of heat and it's one of the highest performance buildings in a cold climate in the U.S. And it was 200, um, it was uh, net zero, and it came in on time and on budget. Um, there's, I don't think I've got time to play it, but in fact, I've got a link in the uh, presentation. If you click on the button of Kara Carmichael discussing how integrated project delivery was used at RMI, they wanted to show, among other things, a, that you could actually achieve high sustainability uh, within commercially reasonable costs. Um, this is the Mosaic Center in Edmonton, Canada. It seems like everything is in a harsh environment, though this is summer in, Canada, summer in Edmonton. This is also uh, Lee Platinum, Net Zero, and I forgot how many petals of Living Challenge it meets. Uh, this building was done as full IPD, and there's an excellent set of videos also if you um, search on the Mosaic Center in which they, a, a local television crew basically did five videos about how this project was developed and how it met its sustainability goals. Um, a couple years back in 2015, the um, Center for Commission for Environmental Cooperation, which was a joint US, Mexico, Canada group, uh, basically did a study of how to, uh, in fact, improve green building construction in North America and uh, uh, published the Guide to Integrated Design and Delivery, which has a long description in there of how to use integrated project delivery on sustainable projects. I was an advisor on this, so that's full disclosure. Um, but it still is probably one of the better documents linking um, project delivery to sustainable outcomes. A little bit of research. Um, I think we still have some time. Um, it turns out that Penn State has done, in looking at project delivery, um, came to the conclusion that in fact, uh, there was a statistical correlation between integration and cohesion and project outcomes. So, and that the project delivery strategy had a significant impact on team integration. They didn't actually focus so much on IPD and such, mostly because they said people didn't use the term reliably. This is a, uh, uh, study done by University of Minnesota. Uh, they actually have different responses based upon whether you're an owner, a designer, or a contractor. And this is the blended everybody together. If you look at the technical performance goals, um, this group, which had done both IPD and not, came to the conclusion, if you kind of vaguely drop the line down, that about 87% of the projects were better. 87% said that they had better quality of building outcome, technical performance goals. Even though IPD is often cost-based, they still came out better. The worst outcome is that they said the changes were, well, changes, change handling was 
really only 80% better. Another study done by um, Lean Construction Institute, Dutch Data and Analytics did the study, but LCI paid for it. And they looked at four project, they looked at a number of other project delivery methods. If you're fast with math, you'll see that the numbers don't quite come up to 100. Uh, and that's because there are a few project delivery methods, IDIQ, for instance, that got dropped out because there weren't enough of them. But the basic point is that um, if you're under design bid build, you tend to get typical outcomes. And typical outcomes were projects that did not meet their project goals, uh, both in quality, cost, schedule. There are actually five goals, and they didn't meet them. Um, only 11% of those projects. 11% of the total projects uh, did. If you look at CM at risk, it gets better because the opportunity for success goes up, but the failures are about the same. Uh, what that tells me is that early contractor involvement can help you in construction management at risk, uh, but it doesn't save you. Design build comes out somewhat better, although you have less control in design build. Um, Look what happened with IPD. Uh, only 1% on were typical. 22% were best. Uh, the people who did this study basically have, have basically have told me that the real importance is the difference between the orange bar and the blue bar in any given project delivery system. So design bid build, very bad. Uh, construction management at risk, risky 50-50 proposition. Design build, better. Uh, IPD, wow, that's a remarkable outcome. Here's some resources. Um, integrating project delivery was the text that I mentioned. Uh, the updated working definition I mentioned. The action guide for leader. Also, if you're looking at how to deliver target value design and target value delivery from Lean Construction Institute Super Good, the, the Guide to Integrated Design Delivery by Commission for Economic Co Cooperation, and then um, there's just some stuff at our website. So that uh, basically is the prepared presentation. And I'm kind of wondering if we open up the chat window uh, whether or not we can handle a few questions. Yeah, we have some questions, Howard. Um, can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Okay, um, great. Um, thank you so much. That was, you know, that's fascinating. It's, 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 a, it's an area that's near and dear to my heart and certainly hope that um, others, the people that are listening were really inspired to go and, and try to uh, integrate IPD into in, you know, into their world as much as possible. You know the uh, the integration agreement I find um, uh, you know really fascinating and and especially the poly party IPD approach with you know just really even more parties. Uh, it, you know it reminds me of just like a really ecological approach to project delivery um, where you have you know increased stake stakeholder incentives and there's a lot of mutualism so that everybody's you know getting benefit and you know have you seen where people have you know written about ecological aspects related to ipd and the kind of systems approach uh yeah the the cec document that i mentioned also if you look at some of the work in regenerative architecture um by group seven and Blanking on his name at the present moment, um, it always works works with them. It's and it's pretty clear that if you actually are trying to get to really high levels of sustainability, uh, you've got to do something like this. It may not be exactly IPD, but you really have to get all the parties involved on the same page and pulling in the same direction. Otherwise, you're not going to get there. The other thing, which uh, I'm sure all of the people on this uh, call no, is that retrofitting sustainability to a bad project is an expensive thing to do. 
So if somebody comes late in the project and says, oh, by the way, we would like to accomplish the following, it's gonna cost money. If, however, you start with that as a design parameter before you begin, and you have the right information, it's often uh, no cost at all. Um, and so having that understanding of why we want to do this project early on and getting all the parties aligned to it is probably the most cost effective way to get to sustainability. So a couple questions they're asking about restrictions um, within our state construction office related to uh, allowing kind of deep IPD being approved. Have, have you seen, um, you know, other states that, uh, you know, within state government where you've had barriers um, that have been able to be overcome? It's in the United States, it's coming slowly. Um, and in fact, um, in Canada, uh, there's a lot of public. Uh, in Finland, there's a lot of public. Uh, the project I was on this morning is public. Um, but it is a little different kind of public. Uh, I've been approached by a, um, you know, if you're in California, you think everybody from Kansas on is on the East Coast, um, but been, been approached by a, a large uh, state organization to look about how to actually execute uh, IPD projects. Sometimes you can't do pure IPD, but if the, if, the, if the will is there, you can often find workarounds that at least get you close. It's unfortunate you can't go in a straight line because that would be cheaper and faster, but sometimes uh, you, for instance, can use a form of multi-prime done in a kind of funky way to achieve the same outcomes, and we've done that too. Right. Another question. I noticed that two projects you referenced were passive house projects. RMI was certified via FIAS. Uh, the Mosaic Center was not certified, but the design team were trained passive house designers and implemented that approach on the project. Do you have any thoughts about using the passive house approach as a path to high performance while achieving first cost goals? Um. I'm probably, probably the, although my background's bio, my background is biology actually. Um, and so I'm probably not, and although I teach at an engineering school, I'm probably not the, the perfect person to ask this question, but it's always struck me that uh, when you're trying to achieve sustainability, you try to achieve as much inherently in the design of the structure before you try to correct it with systems. And that um, that's better for a couple of reasons. I, I think it's more it's more efficient. It's more reliable. Uh, my son happens to be a cybersecurity. He's a federal agent. Uh, deals with cybercrime and cybersecurity. And I'll tell you, he is very concerned with business building automation systems because he says that the they are a major hole. Uh, from a standpoint of, of cybersecurity um, on projects for all kinds of reasons. So I think the more that you can build in, and he said also that no matter what you do with the building, make sure that you can operate the critical systems manually because they are, if they're completely computerized, and by the way, I'm a former computer programmer. I'm not sort of like anti-technology, but what I'm really saying is that um, you need to have redundancy and you need to start off with a system that is fairly effective before you add bells and whistles. Right. That's, but you just heard a personal opinion based by someone who is not an engineer. Gotcha. Um, thanks. So, you know, kind of building on, on, on FIAS, uh, I, I know that uh, Living Building Challenge and Living Building, building Community are, are being used more and more as a framework. And it seems like, um, you know, the only way to accomplish, uh, you know, a project under these frameworks would have to be through an inter integrated project delivery process. How much, um, are, are you really seeing an increase in, in um, you know, design teams and, and owners really uh, being attracted to that framework? You are, and you're seeing two things which I find kind of interesting. About five, six years ago, I'd show up at a conference 
and people would say, well, we looked at IPD, but you know, we went on da 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 and such, and they'd explain their project. And now he's, uh, if they didn't do it IPD, they, they, they apologize. <laughs> they say, I know we should have done this, but we couldn't bring it all the, and it's the, the assumption that it, it is a better way um, is pretty much, um, it's pretty much gone. I mean, in terms of the, the uh, folks sort of saying that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weird thing and we didn't look at it. Now the assumption is we at least should have looked at it and we're sorry we didn't. Um, the, uh, so, and I'm a little bit of, again, an odd person to ask because I get a, do, I get a lot of cold calls from folks who want to do a project and they know that we've done a lot of them and they've never done one before. And so they really want to have somebody who has some experience. So I have a team of folks who work with me at Hanson Bridget and we stay pretty busy servicing projects across, across the country, across the world. Uh, and uh, when I've been um, said, uh, there's now a growing movement inside of Germany, which as you know, has also a strong sustainability uh, push um, up in Scandinavia. And uh, I, in the teaching I do at Oxford, uh, it is, uh, I've been bringing it in and they have some of their own analogs that they're doing as well. Um, so I, the, the upshot is I think uh, it's definitely, it's definitely um, coming up. It's not coming up as fast as I think it should, um, but um, a lot of people are wed to the existing system. So can you speak about how IPD and, and fully integrated systems can help de-risk projects in the built environment from a future where carbon is priced? Are you, are you seeing where people are asking to design for reduced carbon using IPD? Um, you are seeing it, but the, one of those things that, it, that is affecting sustainability is if you're going to use a metric and tie it to money, you have to have some confidence in your ability to measure that metric. So um, you, sometimes you see soft goals where it's part of the initial uh, plan and project objective is to reduce carbon usage, but it doesn't necessarily say, uh, I may even say reduce carbon usage below something, but it doesn't necessarily tie to money because the people aren't confident enough in their ability to actually uh, generate the numbers. We had a large project just a few years back uh, with, with an owner that was motivated and had an in, almost in, indefinite budget and wanted to figure out how to count, how to assess the, the overall sustainability of the structure and tie it to compensation. And they had a team of five people working, including a couple economists, and they never came up with what they thought was an adequate solution. Um, now, I think hopefully we've advanced a little bit beyond that, but that's a problem. So another question, how important is it, or I guess uh, is two questions and kind of combining them. Have you had non-traditional stakeholders in the integration agreement like in our case, of uh, uh, you know, faculty, staff, and potentially even students. Uh, yeah, um, what we've done in the first place, and a lot of there are, a lot, it's not uncommon in a major project to have a university uh, tie into uh, tracking the project, uh, providing the information. Uh, in fact, I get hit up by graduate students constantly who want to actually research the area and want access to projects. Uh, so that, that comes up fairly often. Penn State basically used it as an, as a, as an opportunity for uh, teaching and their pro one of their projects as much as it was a actual, uh, you know, just get it done project. Brown University has done a number of these projects. 
And this is a little different, but mostly they integrate more of the campus into the project than you would normally see um, in terms of, of input. Um, but as I said, it's not uncommon to have graduate students floating around inside the projects, um, taking notes and trying to figure out what's going on. And, and if you do some research on IPD, you'll see there's a bunch of sort of mastery level theses that people have been tracking in some doctoral stuff. All right, so it looks like we have time for one more. Um, how, how have building information modeling systems been technologies really influenced the development of IPD over time? Because from, from my observation, uh, you know, BIM just got way out in front of this and uh, just, you know, kind of curious what your thoughts are on that. Well, for some of us, actually, uh, integrated project delivery was a way to use BIM better. Okay. Uh, and if you go beyond uh, basically using BIM as, a, as a, a graphic tool to prepare paper drawings um, and maybe to do a little conflict checking, but go into using it for um, opt optimization, being at the uh, whole BDC type stuff, you actually have to now integrate information from different folks than just the traditional designers. And we saw no way of really doing that under traditional project delivery. So there was kind of like a, um, a recognition that high-end BIM was gonna require something like an IPD, just like uh, Lean does. So they're definitely uh, related. The other thing we found is that people who just came in from the technology side suddenly realized that the technology was not solving all the problems they thought it could. And that got them to starting to think about what were the impediments and that took them in the structure area. So it turns out whether you want just to build a building efficiently, whether you have high sustainability goals, whether you have other, it, it, whether you want to use technology effectively, the recipe is about the same. And so what we've seen is a coalescence of, from different, different areas. Um, to try to achieve the same same objective. Well, thank you so much, Howard. This is perfect, really insightful, and uh, very important information to share. And you know, hopefully, it'll help us move the needle a little bit here in North Carolina and the Southeast, and wherever else people are tuning in from. Just really appreciate your time, all of your experience, and you know, sharing all this knowledge with us today. Okay. Well, thank you, and uh, I appreciate what you're all trying to accomplish. All right, thank you. Well, everybody, this wraps up the uh, webinar series for the fall. And um, we are gonna have our mid-year Appalachian Energy Summit on February the 11th, 2021. So uh, more to come on that. We'll make sure that uh, we'll send everyone on, the, on our listserv information regarding the agenda and what to expect. And following that, we're going to have a webinar series as well. Uh, we did record this, uh, so we're gonna hopefully uh, uh, be able to post this for rebroadcast if you wanted to share it with people or or, or watch it again. So um, thank you so much for attending today's webinar. Thanks for those that attended more than one or all of them. And, uh, you know, stay safe out there. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.